morning, everyone. Welcome to class. We'll uh, begin, and then I think uh, Mo will join us. So, can one of you lead us in prayer, please? Susan, can you lead us in prayer, please? Sorry, ma'am, I am outside. <laughs> okay, no worries. Uh, anyone like to lead us in prayer? Sri Kumar, can you lead us in prayer, please? Yes, Master. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Precious Father, we thank you and praise you, Father God, for this a wonderful morning which you have given to us, O oh God. As we are looking unto you, my Father, we ask you, Lord Master, let your divine wisdom be released to us, O oh God. Every word which is going to come out from the mouth of your servant, let it be from the throne room of God, oh Father. We pray that, Father, fill us with the spirit of wisdom and understanding so that, Father, we can able to receive every word, O oh Father God, and we can able to keep those words, guard those words in us, O oh Father. So that we can able to use these words in our life for God. Those principles, what she's what she's going to teach us. Those Lord Master, those those things what we are going to know today, Father God. Learn from Lord. Those ignore, let the ignorance be removed from us. And let these words give us light to Father God. Thank you for covering each one of our hearts with your blood, O oh God Master, and sealing those words, O oh Lord Master, so that we can able to hold on that word, O oh God Master. And so that those words we Lord Master produce harvest in us, O oh Father God. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' most holy and matchless name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Sri Kumar. Okay, so we'll uh, begin. we we'll just do a quick recap. Uh, you know, we're studying this uh, beautiful book, the book of uh, Romans, Paul ep Paul's epistle to the church at Rome. And we know that this book is uh, heavy in doctrine and teaching. The first few chapters, Paul is establishing sound doctrine about various things. He's teaching about various things. And then in the later chapters, he establishes about uh, Christian living. So just quick review, chapter one, you know, after Paul presents his salutation and his uh, desire, expressing his desire to come to Rome, he starts off by saying that we all have sinned against uh, God. And in the midst of this, he establishes the existence of God. And he talks uh, and he mentions that the invisible attributes of God um, are revealed in creation. So none of us have excuse uh, because God has revealed himself in creation. Uh, but he says, in spite of this, you know, people have, um, uh, mankind has given themselves to very depraved uh, minds. They're depraved in their minds. They've gone the wrong way. And, uh, you know, God, um, you know, does, did not stop us. He just lets us go in our own way. That is chapter one, uh, very briefly. So chapter two, we, you know, we saw that he's specifically writing for the, to the Jewish people. He's telling them that uh, Jews, uh, we know that God gave you the laws, uh, the circumcision ritual as a covenant. Uh, both these things are wonderful, but don't think that because you have the law and the circumcision, which is a sign of the covenant, uh, you know, you can judge others and you can escape the judgment of uh, God. So he says, though you have the law, and though you have the sign, uh, the, the circumcision is a sign of the covenant, uh, you still stand condemned before God. And then he tells the Gentiles, well, you don't have the law. You were not given the law. You don't have uh, uh, circumcision as a sign of the covenant. But God has put inside you uh, a conscience, which is a law in itself, because the conscience tells us, uh, what is right and what is wrong. And then if you put chapter 1 and chapter 2 together, uh, you know, um, uh, Paul is saying that every person has two witnesses from God. Uh, one is reason, uh, you know, uh, uh, through reason we can observe through creation that there is a God, uh, that God exists. And the second witness from God is uh, conscience, uh, that God has put in us a conscience so we know what is right and wrong, uh, which is our sense of morality. So this is what, uh, very briefly, uh, in a quick review of chapter 2. And in chapter 3, 
you know, he um, asked some questions, I think almost seven questions, and he's answering uh, it himself, uh, which is called rhetorical questions. Um, and, you know, he, he starts off by asking, is it useless then to receive the law? Because, you know, um, uh, you know, we are all sinners. You know, Paul is saying that uh, all of us are sinners. We stand condemned before God. And, you know, there's no point in us, uh, you know, don't think kind, great about yourself because you have the law. So uh, the Jews might be thinking or asking this question, then what's the law used for? Is the law useless? Uh, and then, you know, he answers it. He says, no. What happens if, the second question, what happens if someone does not believe? Uh, does it change about, anything about God, you know, it does not change anything about God. God still remains faithful. He still is just, uh, he still is righteous. He justifies sin uh, uh, by condemning it and he justifies the sinner, okay? And then, you know, um, uh, he comes up with another question um, in chapter three, which we looked at uh, in the previous class. Uh, he says, is God unjust because he inflicts wrath on us? Uh, the Jews might be thinking or asking or saying that if our wrong deeds is going to make God look good, then is he unfair in punishing us for our wrong deeds? And um, Paul again answers no, and we looked at the example of uh, Judas there, and uh, we saw that God is just, he's a just God, and, uh, and because he is just, because he is righteous, he has to judge sin. And then Paul moves on uh, to say that none of us are perfect uh, because all of us have sinned. We all stand uh, condemned uh, before God and no one is justified because of keeping the law or, uh, you know, the sign of covenant, which is circumcision. And then Paul leads us beautifully uh, by bringing out a solution, uh, you know, um, and he says, God, you know, has brought us out of this by, you know, giving us a beautiful solution. Yes, we all are guilty before God, uh, but God has provided the solution. Okay. Uh, you know, we are guilty, uh, but God has given us his righteousness. Uh, we receive his righteousness freely by grace through faith. And it's because of the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. So what is the solution? Uh, that God has provided for us, even though we all stand condemned and guilty before God, is that, you know, we have redemption in Jesus Christ and we receive uh, uh, righteousness because of the redemption in Jesus Christ. We receive it freely by grace through faith. Okay. And in verse 25, he talks about uh, how, uh, you know, God made Jesus as our mercy seat. Uh, the word used there is propitiation. But when translated in the Greek is mercy seat, and mercy seat is something that every Jew is very aware of because uh, in the tabernacle, like I explained, in the Holy of Holies is the Ark of the Covenant. On top of the cover of the Ark of the Covenant are the two um, uh, angels with their wings, they're covering their wings, and in, in, in the middle of that is the mercy seat where the high priest goes once in a year, makes an atonement sacrifice for himself and the entire Israelite race. He takes the blood of the atoning uh, sacrifice and he sprinkles it on the mercy seat. And he sprinkles on the mercy seat. God says, there I will come and meet with you. You know, there is where man is made righteous before God. There's a right standing before God. God speaks to man. He meets man. Uh, and, um, you know, each one of us are made righteous in God's sight is because God made Jesus our mercy seat. Jesus became that sacrifice for us. And because of his sacrifice, you know, uh, we have a right standing with God. We can speak to God. God can speak to us and we can meet with God. So that is where uh, we stopped. Uh, we will continue. Uh, we read verses 27 to 31. Uh, and uh, can somebody uh, again read that for us, please? Romans chapter 3, verses 27 to 31. Romans 3, 27 to 31. Pastor, can I read? Sure, thank you. Yeah. Uh, where then is boasting? It is excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires works. No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith 
apart from the works of the law? Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through the same faith, do then do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Sri Kumar. So here in uh, this concluding um, verses of chapter 3, uh, Paul is asking three questions in verse 27, verse 29, and verse 31. Um, so in verse 27, he's saying, what about the law? What about the works? Where is the boasting then? Okay. So Paul is saying no one can boast. Uh, you know, no one. No one can take the credit for themselves. We cannot boast Jews. We cannot boast the law uh, and works. Uh, and, uh, you know, so he answers the question and he says, you know, um, that he asks, he says, no one can boast because now everything is by faith. So we see how beautifully he's bringing in uh, faith. He's first presented that, you know, the Jews have the law, they have the circumcision, which is the sign of the covenant. The Gentiles, you know, uh, God has given them reason, conscience, uh, but, uh, you know, irrespective of the law, the circumcision, the reason, the conscience, we are all only justified by faith. Okay, so he says, and he uh, asks the question, where is the boasting that so no one can boast? Why can no one boast? Because now everything is by faith. Uh, so how is boasting uh, excluded because of the law of faith? Okay, uh, now he's slowly guiding them to the next topic, which is faith, uh, which he, you know, discusses, uh, you know, uh, deeply in, in chapter four, but he's trying to introduce this um, uh, topic about uh, faith. And then in verse 28, uh, he presents the conclusion of what he has been uh, discussing all this time. He says that man is made righteous uh, or man is justified, not by keeping the law, not by the works, but by faith. Okay, not even to his conscience, but by faith. So man is put in a right standing with God. Right standing with God means man is made faultless or blameless before God uh, by faith. Okay, so it's not dependent on the deeds of the law or doing the things of the law, but man is made righteous, he's justified, he uh, stands blameless or faultless before God by faith. In verse 29, he asks a next question, another question. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? And, um, and he answers this question by saying, yes, of the Gentiles also. So Paul says, though God, though God gave the law and the covenant to the Jews first, uh, yet, you know, he is God both of the Jews and the Gentiles. In verse 30, he says, both Jews and Gentiles are going to be justified by faith. Paul is telling them, Jews, whether you are circumcised or uncircumcised, like the Gentiles were uncircumcised, it's going to be by faith that we are going to be justified. So there's no point in you know uh, talking about circumcision, keeping the ritual of circumcision, and uh, telling those who are Gentiles or Greeks who come to the faith, who become part of the church, that they have to be circumcised. Because we are not justified or made righteous in God's sight by keeping the law or by circumcision, but we are justified by faith. So the main thing here is what he's getting into is that, you know, we are justified by faith. Then he says, you know, what is the use of the law? You know, we are, uh, uh, Paul is saying, I'm not making void of the law. Uh, I'm not saying that the law is useless. Uh, on the contrary, he's saying we establish the law. Okay, so how do we establish the law? Because Paul has stated that no one can keep the law. You know, the Jews say we have the law, we have the covenants, we have the circumcision, but, you know, we read that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So, you know, he stated before that no one can keep the law. All of us are sinners. 
And uh, the law serves that purpose. Okay, what does the law serve? The law is basically uh, something that exposes our sin. It shows where we have missed the mark. It shows that we are sinners. It shows that we stand uh, guilty uh, before God because we have done something uh, wrong. Okay, so the law uh, is basically you know, serving its purpose. It's exposing sin. It shows that we are guilty before God, that we have missed the mark, that we have done things that God has asked us not to do. Now, the same sin that the law has condemned, okay, God has condemned in the person of Jesus Christ, which means God has judged sin in the person of Jesus Christ on the cross. So, um, so that, you know, through what Jesus has done on the cross, he can justify sinners who come to him in faith. He can justify sinners who come to faith in Christ Jesus. Okay, so Paul is saying that you know, uh, you know, the law is not useless. It serves a purpose. It uh, uh, it uh, you know exposes sin. It condemns the the uh, the sin. The same way, you know, just as the law condemns sin, God has condemned sin in the person of Jesus Christ. He has judged it in the person of Jesus Christ on the cross. Uh, so that, you know, he can justify people who come to faith in Christ. So your faith comes in. A faith is not telling us that the law is not necessary. Okay, Faith comes in because the law was there, but we were unable to keep the law. We couldn't match up to the law. Our works fell short of the requirements of the law. We couldn't keep the law. We couldn't keep the requirements of God's standard. Okay, we fell short of it. So faith had to come in. And faith is not doing away with the law, but faith is actually fulfilling what the law was supposed to do. Okay, so faith is saying that, uh, you know, it is a whole purpose the law showed us that we couldn't do it on our own. So the only way we can ever be righteous in God's sight is going through faith. Okay, The law was given to us so that we can be made righteous in God's sight, but we couldn't keep the law. So faith comes in and faith is saying that this is the whole purpose. The law showed us that we couldn't do it, that we couldn't do it on our own. We couldn't keep the law. So the only way we could ever be made righteous is by faith, is going uh, you know, through the way of faith. So faith in effect actually has established a law. So everyone has come to, you know, this place where we have faith in God saying we cannot keep the law. And hence, because we cannot keep the law, you know, we come to faith in Jesus. So we are establishing the law. We are affirming the law that, yes, we cannot keep it. And we can come to faith in Christ. We can we can be made righteous. We can be justified in God's sight. We can be blamed. We can stand blameless in His sight only when we have faith in Jesus Christ. So faith has established what the law has always been telling us that we have fallen short of God's glory, and uh, you know, um, and so we can come to faith in Christ Jesus by which we can be made righteous, by which we can be justified, by which we can stand faultless and blameless before the most high, holy, eternal King, that is God. So this is what he uh, concludes this whole discussion about, how beautifully he brings in, you know, uh, law, circumcision for the Jews, for the Gentiles, how beautifully he talks about reason, conscience. And then he says, you know, that we will be justified uh, not by any of these things, um, but by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then, you know, he goes on to say that, uh, you know, we will be justified uh, by faith in uh, Jesus Christ. So it's not the law, it's not the circumcision, it's not our conscience that will justify us, make us righteous, because we couldn't keep the law. So faith had to come in, and it's only through faith in Jesus Christ that we can be made uh, righteous in God's sight. So he ends the chapter uh, with this beautiful conclusion. So on this note, he's saying, you know, all of us are on the same level. Jews, Greeks, Gentiles, all on the same level. 
because we're all being made righteous or being justified in God's sight um, uh, because uh, when we have faith in Jesus Christ. And it is by grace that uh, we receive it through faith and it's uh, because of the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. The price that Jesus Christ paid uh, to buy us back from the slavery of sin, that is redemption, buy us back from the slavery of sin, and not only just buy us back from the slavery of sin, but reinstating redemption. There's a whole different, con beautiful concept of redemption saying, you know, we are reinstated back to our original position, our original place, uh, where we are sons and daughters, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ Jesus. So see how beautifully he brings about this whole reasoning and argument. And then he goes on to talk deeper about faith, which is, again, a very beautiful um, way that he presents about how we can be justified or made righteous by faith. Okay, so that is end of chapter 3. Anyone has any questions? I hope all of you are understanding. Yes, ma'am. Yes, okay. Anyone has any questions? Okay, no questions means we'll move on to um, chapter four. Okay, chapter four, he's, uh, you know, moving on to talking about how we are made righteous by faith. So in this chapter, we can divide this chapter into two main sections. Uh, one where he establishes that, uh, you know, faith came before the law and the covenant. So before the law and the covenants, there was faith. Okay. And uh, he gives an example of Abraham. Why does he give the example of Abraham? You know, Paul is very smart. Uh, because for every Jew, Abraham is a patriarch, is the father. Uh, so he says that Abraham, you know, was justified by faith or he was made righteous by faith and he received this righteousness by faith. And this happened even before God gave the uh, circumcision ritual or the laws, even before the laws and the circumcision, you know, Abraham was justified by faith. He was made righteous by uh, faith. Um, and he says the circumcision was given to Abraham, you know, after he was made righteous by faith. So both circumcision and the law came after faith. So what he's saying is that faith did not show up after Jesus, but faith was there way back uh, with Abraham, even before circumcision, even before the law. So now he's really trying to get their attention and very smartly he's bringing in Abraham and, you know, very beautifully he's presenting his um, reasoning because, you know, when he's presenting this, you know, no Jew can argue. Then they all have to agree saying, yes, you know, the Bible says, the scripture says that Abraham was made righteous. He was justified by faith. He was justified, made righteous by faith even before he received the circumcision ritual even before the law was given. So that's, uh, you know, the first part of um, uh, one section of chapter four. The other section of part of, uh, chapter four is, uh, you know, he gives us insights into Abraham's faith. Uh, and there Paul is saying that the faith is what both Jews and Gentiles are going to be walking in. Okay, whether you are a Jew or a Gentile, you're going to be walking in the faith of Abraham. And he talks about Abraham's faith in God. And he says, this is how we, whether we are Jews or Gentiles, must have faith in God. And it's just amazing how Paul, you know, is expressing the mind of God in helping these people to see that faith is both for the Jews and Gentiles. And faith is not by just works uh, by keeping the law or by circumcision ritual. So we need to get done with that. You need to come by faith into uh, in Jesus Christ uh, to be justified, to be standing blameless and faultless before God. Okay. So we'll look at Romans chapter 4. Uh, can somebody please read Romans chapter 4 verses 1 to 3, please? Romans 4, 1 to 3. Okay. 
Yes. Okay. Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of our Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God? If his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, he would have something to boast about. But that was not God's ways. For the scriptures tell us, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. Thank you, Kung. So he starts off uh, chapter 4 by asking a question. He says, um, you know, uh, what then shall we say that Abraham, our father, was found according to the flesh? Now here in chapter 4, he talks about uh, Abraham and David, two patriarchs. Uh, the Jews took uh, much pride in Abraham and David, uh, who were the two great patriarchs. Abraham was the father of the entire Jewish race, and David, uh, their king, who established them in the land that God had appointed them. Uh, and so when Paul says Abraham, and he talks about Abraham, they all the Jews understood him because they knew Abraham as their forefather, as their forerunner. So he asked the question, was Abraham justified by works? And, uh, you know, he quotes uh, an Old Testament uh, reference here from Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. If you remember, we said in the introduction, you know, uh, Paul uh, brings and quotes a lot of Old Testament scripture because he's a scholar. He studied um, the Torah. He knows the Torah in and out. He knows the Old Testament scriptures well because he studied it under Gamaliel. Um, a great teacher uh, of the Old Testament. Okay, so he says, he, he presents here uh, Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So Abraham received righteousness based on one thing. And what is that one thing? He's clearly mentioning here that it is because he believed in God. Okay, and no one can argue that because that is this is in scripture. So he's saying, Paul is saying, look at Abraham. What does scripture say about him? It says that he believed God and God granted to him as righteousness, which means he was made righteous in God's sight because he believed, because he had faith in God. Now the Greek word uh, for accounted, okay, um, uh, which Paul uses 11 times in the same chapter, uh, uh, in the NKJV, NKJV is translated as accounted, counted, imputes, impute, or imputed. Sorry. In the KJV, it's translated as counted, reckoned, imputed. Now, this is a word that basically has to do with the counting, financial counting, calculation. Uh, it simply means that, you know, put into one's account. Okay, put into one's account. Um, I, so in our usage, we can say that it's credited into one's account or deposited into one's account. Uh, so Abraham, when he believed God, God deposited to him or God credited to him or God accounted to him righteousness. So when we put our faith in God, it's God's, Jesus's righteousness that has been deposited, that has been accounted, that has been credited, that has been put into our account. It's not our righteousness, but it's Jesus's uh, righteousness, which has been put into our account. And that's why we stand righteous before God. So Abraham received righteousness by believing God. Okay. We'll move on to verses uh, 4 to verse 8. So can somebody read verses 4 to verse 8, please? Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as death. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God puts of righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Thank you, Asha. So Paul goes on to say, but if a man uh, does not work, or if a man, if he believes, 
you know, he receives it purely by grace to faith. So if a man believes, he receives his righteousness purely by grace through faith. So he's saying Abraham received righteousness purely by believing, uh, and that is by faith and not by works. So the righteousness that God gave him is by grace through faith because he believed in God. Now, uh, the Greek word uh, for grace is charis. And it's used, uh, you know, uh, differently in uh, different settings or contexts in the New Testament. Um, and it's used in three ways in the New Testament. It's used for divine favor, uh, which means divine acceptance. Uh, you know, God accepts us just how we are. And Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says, For the grace you have been, uh, for by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourself it's a gift of god okay so god uh, the first um, uh, context or the usage of how grace is used in the new testament is a divine favor where divine acceptance god accepts us just the way we are the second usage in the new testament of grace is divine character it's basically talking about the character of god uh, for example in john chapter 1 verse 14 we see that the word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us and we see the glory the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth so grace and truth is the character of god and uh, the bible tells us as believers that we all need to grow into christ likeness we read this in second peter chapter 3 verse 18 where it says but grow in the grace and the knowledge our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. That is the second usage where it's talking about divine character, the character of God. Uh, wherever we see, uh, you know, um, grace, uh, we need to interpret it maybe in this context of divine character of God. And another usage of grace in the New Testament is divine enablement or divine uh, empowerment. Grace is a divine empowerment of God. For example, when uh, Paul tells, uh, uh, you know, has a thorn in the flesh, and uh, which is a repeated attack of Satan or the enemy, uh, he asks God to take it away. And what does God say, tell him? My grace is sufficient for you. That means, uh, you know, my divine enablement, my divine empowerment uh, is enough for you to go through this situation in life. Okay. So uh, this divine enablement uh, is given to every believer. So charis, which means grace, uh, has been uh, can be interpreted in three in these three different um, contexts in the New Testament. It can be uh, interpreted as uh, divine favor or divine acceptance, divine character or divine enablement or empowerment of God. And based on the context, we need to uh, interpret it correctly. So in this context, when we're talking about grace, it's basically talking about divine favor. Okay, it's a generous deed done by God. It is done out of the heart of God uh, without expecting anything in return. So divine favor uh, basically is a generous deed which is done out of the heart of a person, the heart of the bestower uh, without expecting anything in um, return. Now we often use the phrase unmerited favor. Okay, so grace in us uh, is receiving what we did not res uh, deserve and what we cannot earn. That's why it's unmerited favor because uh, we don't deserve it and we cannot earn it. So grace is God doing for us and through us what we could never do for ourselves. So grace begins where our ability ends and it's often explained as an acronym, you know, uh, G-R-A-C-E, which means God's riches at Christ's expense. Okay, so here in this context, Paul is talking about grace, talking about divine favor. Now, I'd like you to consider uh, this phrase, you know, uh, him who justifies the ungodly, him who justifies the ungodly in verse 5. Okay, um, now this is powerful. Uh, 
uh, it's a powerful phrase, even though it sounds paradoxical, uh, God is declaring that the ungodly as righteous. Imagine, you know, we who are ungodly, you know, God is declaring us as righteous. Um, and we cannot do this on our own. It's just a favor of God, unmerited favor of God. That God can do this for us. He can look at us uh, who are ungodly, who are sinners as righteous because of the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, which we already uh, saw in chapter 3, which Paul has already mentioned in chapter 3. So we stand justified, stand righteous before God. And, uh, you know, uh, we who are sinners are looked as righteous upon this holy God. It's because of the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. And then in verses 6 to 8, you know, Paul is pointing out to David. And again, he quotes uh, from Old Testament here. Uh, Paul quotes the first two verses from Psalm 32. Uh, but we will look at a few additional verses from Psalm 32. Uh, we will look at verses 1 to 5 so that we can understand uh, the context. So in Psalm 32, it says, the psalm says, uh, the David, psalmist David says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is a man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Verse 5, Paul says, I, uh, sorry, uh, David says, I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah. Okay, so Paul points out here that even David, you know, received righteousness apart from works. Okay, he confessed his sin. And he received forgiveness. So by faith, he received uh, the blessedness of having his sins uh, forgiven. I'd like you to consider this phrase, the blessedness. Uh, okay, the blessedness of the man who does, who God declares righteous or credits with righteousness. So being declared righteous uh, before God brings us to a place of blessedness. Uh, it brings us to a place where, uh, of blessings that uh, we cannot receive by any other means uh, or by keeping the law or by good works uh, or we cannot receive in any other place. We receive it only when, uh, you know, we believe in Jesus Christ and we are made righteous in his sight. So blessed is a man whose sins are forgiven. Okay, so that is what uh, he talks about in um, these verses, in um, verses uh, um, 4 to verse 8. Okay, we'll move on to verses uh, 9 to 12, and then we'll take up any questions if there are. Okay, so can somebody read verses 9 to 12, please? Romans 4, 9 to 12. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised only? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. Yes, verses 12, 11 and 12 also, Asha, please. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had, while still uncircumcised. Thank you, Asha. So having established from the Old Testament the example of righteousness uh, given on the basis of faith in the life of Paul, uh, sorry, in the life of Abraham, Paul then addresses the question of circumcision. So was this righteousness given because of circumcision 
Paul points again to Abraham, uh, who he says, you know, he received the righteousness by faith. You know, uh, we read this in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Even before, you know, uh, Abraham received the sign of circumcision, which is in Genesis chapter 17, verse 10, you know, he was made righteous or he was justified by faith. And so Paul is saying Abraham was blessed. He received uh, this blessing. Now, how did he receive this blessing? In verse 9, um, Paul says, you know, um, how did he receive this uh, blessing? He says, you know, um, did he receive it when he was circumcised? Or did he receive when he was uncircumcised? And he says he received it when he was uncircumcised. And later on, you know, he was circumcised. That which means he's again proving the fact that Abraham was justified or received his righteousness by faith, you know, even before he was uh, circumcised or even before he received uh, the circumcision as a sign of covenant. And he says, which was a seal of the righteousness of so God gave him this covenant after God made him uh, righteous through faith. Okay, so first he's saying that you know Paul, uh, Abraham was not made righteousness because of the law or because he uh, uh, he was given the law and the covenants or not because of his uh, good works or good deeds, but he was made righteous by faith. And then he moves on to say that you know even before. Uh, you know, God gave him this, uh, the sign of the covenant as the circumcision as a sign of the covenant. Even before he gave that, you know, uh, Abraham was made uh, righteous because of his belief in God, because of his faith in um, uh, God. So the reason God gave him uh, is, you know, we see this in the latter part of verse 11, was so that Abraham could be the father of all who believe so he's kind of stretching that thinking okay so he's saying that jews you know don't you know don't think that because you have the laws you have the covenants you have the higher place uh you know because you have the law the covenants the circumcision uh and all of those things uh it's not that because you know your father abraham your forefather abraham the patriarch uh abraham you know uh, was made righteous by Faith. And why did God make him righteous by faith even before he gave him the laws, the covenants, or even before the circumcision was so that, you know, he could be a father of all who believe, all who have faith in God. So he's kind of stretching their thinking. So Abraham, before he had the circumcision, uh, he had faith. So Abraham is a father of all who have Faith. So he's saying that Abraham is not only uh, the father or the patriarch of uh, the Jews, but also the Greeks, also the Gentiles. Why? Because he's a father of all who have faith. And in verse 12, he says, not just circumcision is required, uh, you know, to be made justified or to be made righteous in God's sight, but you need to walk in the faith of Abraham. So don't hold on to circumcision ritual. It's only by faith because, uh, you know, your forefather, Abraham, was justified, made righteous by faith even before the sign of circumcision. So he's basically telling the Jews, you know, the Jews were making this mandatory, giving it up, making a hard time for all those Gentiles, uh, Greeks who are coming into the church. You know, you have to follow the law. You have to follow these patterns of eating. Uh, you have to be circumcised. Uh, so, you know, Paul is very beautifully mentioning it. He says, you know, Abraham was justified by faith even before uh, circumcision. So Paul is basically stating two things here. The first is that Abraham received righteousness by faith so that he would be the father of everyone who walks in faith. Even if they are uncircumcised, uh, which means the Gentiles, or even if they are circumcised, which means the Jews. And so he's saying, you know, they, we all come to a common denominator, a common place. We all receive righteousness by faith. The second thing he's saying is uh, he's, Abraham is the father of circumcision, okay? But he's not really of circumcision, but you need to walk in the faith of Abraham because that is what is going to make you righteous because that is what made Abraham righteous first and not 
circumcision. So Paul is saying, even if you are circumcised, you have to walk by faith like Abraham walked in faith. So now Paul moves on uh, to Abraham's faith. What was his faith like and what we can say about Abraham's faith? And that he talks about in the next few verses, uh, in verses 13 uh, following. Okay, so verses 13 to verse 16, we see the promises based on faith because of grace. Okay, uh, so can somebody read that please? Uh, verses 13 to verse 16. Can somebody read verses 13 to verse 16 please? Can I read that sir? Yeah, sure, go ahead. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. Because the law brings about wrath, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Thank you, uh, Asha. So here we, you know, Paul is very beautifully presenting that the promises that God gave Abraham, that through him, you know, you'll have a seed and, uh, you know, uh, uh, through him, uh, uh, nations will come out, generations will be blessed, they will be numerous as the stars in the sky, the sand on the seashore, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through Abraham. And so the promise that God gave Abraham was something he gave at the point of faith. You know, when he was made righteous by faith, it was given to him when he stepped out in faith, he believed uh, uh, God, he stepped out, he went to the promised land and he received those promises because, uh, you know, he had faith in, G in God, because he believed in God, because he was made righteous by faith, even before God gave him the sign of the covenant of circumcision. So the promises that um, Abraham inherited uh, or God gave it to him was when he stepped out in faith. It was given at the point of his faith when he was made righteous by faith. The promise was through the righteousness of faith and it was not and it is not just who are of the law who receive the promise but as everyone who has faith will inherit this promise. So Paul is so beautifully bringing it here, uh, out here. He's saying now Abraham received all his promises when? When did he receive it? He received it you know when he had faith in uh, in God. When he stepped out in faith, he was made righteous by faith, even before circumcision, even before the law. So he's saying all those, you know, who have the law and who all those who have been given the sign of the covenant, which is circumcision, which is he's talking about, the Jews are not the only ones who will receive the promise of Abraham. But he says is everyone who has faith Faith in whom? Faith in Jesus Christ, faith in his gospel, who will inherit this promise because Abraham received this, these promises when he was justified or made righteous by faith. So what is the promise? You know, um, I will bless you. I will make you a blessing. This was this promise was given and uh, your generations will be numerous as the stars in the sky, the sand on the seashore. So this promise was given to Abraham and to his descendants. And Paul is saying he's given to it, him even before the law or the circumcision ritual was given. And this promise is not just for those who are uh, custodians of the law or of the covenants or the sign of circumcision. It's not just the descendants of Abraham who have been given the law and the circumcision, which he's talking about the Jews, but it's also to all who have faith in Jesus Christ. So all those who have faith in Jesus Christ will inherit this promise or will be partakers of this promise or will be part of this promise that was given to Abraham. Hence, Abraham is the father of us all, which means he's the father of all the Jews, the Gentiles and Greeks who have, uh, you know, who believe in Jesus Christ, who come to faith in Jesus Christ, um, 
uh, when they put their faith in him and it's because of the grace of uh, of god and the redemption work of Jesus Christ. So you see how beautifully he's just bringing out everything. And so Paul is repeating this point that Abraham is the father of all who have faith and all who have faith receive the promise that God gave Abraham. And this is according to the grace of God. It's unmerited favor. It's something that we don't deserve. And so it's he's saying it's faith, righteousness, and grace. And it's given to everyone to both Jews and Gentiles. So you see how beautifully he's bringing about this whole argument. So he's saying that it is basically faith, uh, righteousness, we made uh, righteous by keeping the faith and it's a grace of God. And it's through the redemption, uh, redemptive work of Jesus Christ and it's given to everyone, to both Jews and Gentiles. And now he gets on to verses 17 where he gets into the fate of Abraham. He's talking about the basic uh, details of the dimensions of the fate of Abraham, which we will look in our next class on Friday. We'll stop here. Anyone has any questions? Any questions? Okay, I hope all of you are in class and hope all of you have understood. Okay. No questions? Okay. Okay, if there are no questions, we'll end class. Uh, thank you all for um, uh, joining class. I'll see you on Friday and uh, we'll continue with uh, the rest of the